and Safrina to come down and uh, share with us. Uh, has been over to the school in Thailand and ministered to the young men and women over there as well. Um, I don't know if I need to say anything more. Oh, the only thing I will say is I said they could do what they want. That's a response I love you guys. And I think they're going to do a bit of tag team and all that sort of stuff. Well, we'll just start. Um, first, I just wanted to thank you for having us today. It's really an honour to be able to come and uh, share with you guys and be part of what God is doing. It's always a privilege, you know, and a blessing and a joy. Um, I won't get into how we know them and all that, but I just want to say thank you very much. And really appreciate what you all do, what you guys do here. If only you guys could see what God sees when He sees at this church, you will be blown away with joy. We will do some tag, tag preaching, more like tag ministry today. Uh, we were fasting during the whole week. Um, and before I say the rest, actually, I just want to say, like, my wife, thank you for, for inviting us here. Uh, we are really honoured, and I'm not saying this as a cliche, to be here preaching in your church. We've heard about this church for a very long time, for years, when you guys were still Jubilee Church. So God has got an amazing plan for this church. Um, now, I can preach without books and things like that. But today, uh, I've got my phone. I'm going to be reading from my phone. And, I, and I've done that intentionally because there's quite, quite a few scriptures I'm going to be throwing at you. Um, also, there's specific things that, that God speaks to you sometimes that it's better said when you write it down. Because I can say it out of my emotion. I can say it out of my thoughts. But it's very different when I say it exactly like God told me to say it. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I believe that some of the things I'm going to reveal today as well uh, is actually very prophetic for the church. Not just this church, but the body of Christ as a whole. It's prophetic for the times we're living in as well. <clears throat> and I'm really excited to see what God's going to do in this place. I really am. We love uh, Sabrina and I, as, uh, as Sue was saying, uh, we've been around a bit. And we've uh, passed at a church as well and all that sort of stuff. So uh, we're young, but we've gone through quite a bit. We've gone through quite a bit. So God's been teaching us through this journey. And I believe that we actually... Uh, and this is a cool thing. Uh, we're not coming here and just ministering to you. We're going to go through this journey with you guys. We're going to make this house, this place, our home church. So uh, I'm saying that publicly as well. <laughs> because it can hold us accountable <laughs> for what we're about to tell you today. Um, and we're going to go through this journey together. So uh, we're not just going to come here and drop a bomb and then leave. We're not like that. So, I'm getting out my phone. I like to start with, some, with sometimes with a story or a joke or, or, um, or a quote. And I found a quote that uh, is really relevant for what I'm going to be speaking about today. It's from A.W. Tozer. I'm pretty sure most of you have heard this before, have heard about him. And he said, we can be in our day what the heroes of faith were in their day. But remember, at the time, they didn't know they were heroes. This is a great quote. Because the title of the message I have today is The, the Bigger Picture. The Bigger Picture. Uh, and I'm speaking that prophetically onto this church. There is a bigger picture to what? To the, to the journey you've been going through. I may be speaking from the book of Ruth. Now, not everything in the book of Ruth is relevant to you guys or relevant to the church at the moment, specifically you guys are what you're going through right now, may not be relevant, but you are mature. A lot of you are very mature and have been in this church for a long time, so you're mature enough to discern what is relevant to you in the journey that you're going through or not. So take these things. Some of them I will, I will unpack, some of them I won't. I'll leave it to you to unpack it in your own time with God, in your own time with prayer for the church. But the story of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the story of Ruth begins with a famine in Israel. In the time that the, of Ruth, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of sin going on. There was a lot of uh, uh, disobedience and apostasy, as I say. It actually starts from the book of Deuteronomy 28. And it goes right through to Deuteronomy 30 and then right through the book of Ruth. There was a lot of obedience, a lot of things that they were doing which was not good in the sight of God. Now, like I said, don't take this as if I'm speaking to you. Discern what I'm saying. <clears throat> now, 
The important thing is as well, is I'm going to point out this, several characters that, that God speaks about in this story. Uh, one of the characters is Elimelech. Elimelech was Naomi's wife. He was a father. And he, his name actually means, my God is king. Elimelech. There's also Naomi, which is his wife. Naomi actually plays a big part in this story. Her name actually means pleasant. And later on in the story, she goes through so much, she actually thought that God wasn't on her side. So she, she actually tells people, don't call me uh, Naomi anymore, call me Myra, which means bitter. She became bitter because of what she was going through. <clears throat> and it's very easy to get through that, to get into that situation, especially when you go through obstacle after obstacle, and you're like, when is this going to finish? You know? There's also Malon. Malon was the son who was married to Ruth, the main character of the, of the story. Malon's name means sick, and in fact, he actually became sick and he actually died in the story. There's Ruth, which means friendship, and it's seen through her, through her life and the way that she dealt with the situation, how she embraced Naomi uh, in, in the whole journey. She stood with her. She didn't let go. By the way, I like to walk around, see so if that bothers you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's why I moved that. Um, oops. Give me a second here. There's more. There is Chilion. Chilion is the other son, which means pinning. And he, the same thing, he actually died when they moved. They actually moved, and I'll tell you a little bit more later, they moved from Bethlehem. And they moved to Moab, another place. And during that time in Moab, they actually died. The father died, the two sons died. So Chilion means pinning. And there's Orpah. Orpah was Chilion's wife, which means stubbornness. And then there is the other main character, Boaz, which means in him is strength. In him is strength. Through Boaz, God brought redemption to that family. Now, I don't want to reveal too much. Let me read Ruth 1.4. Ruth 1.4 says, Now they took wives of the woman, the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orba, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. I'm pointing this out on purpose. Why am I reading this one out? Because they were there for 10 years. 10 years. How many times do you read the Bible and you see throughout the Old Testament and New Testament where God gives you a prophetic word and you don't see it until a year, two years, three years, four years later and you go, wow, oh, how is that possible? What happened to David? He was anointed. He was still a shepherd. Then he became a senior in the king's court. It took some time. It took time in the journey for them to actually get to where God wanted to get to. doesn't mean he didn't have the waters along the way. And I'll speak about that. They did. But it's part of the journey, part of the growth as well. All right, let me give you a context in the whole story because I don't want to go through the whole story. I want to go through one little point, which is right at the end of this story. And the reason is that when, I, when we were fasting and praying, so, uh, I actually told my wife, I usually don't say what I'm going to preach about. And I told my wife and I said, something is not right here. Um, it just seems too simple, the story of Ruth and and trying to link it to, the, to this church. Why, why, you know, it just is, doesn't seem right. And God said, no, read the whole story. Read the whole story. Because this point that I'm going to make today is not about this whole story. I'm giving you a context to the main point, which is right at the end. But you need to know the context. Because if I just tell the last point, through some of the scriptures, it's just tell you a little bit about the story. Just so you have that context behind everything. So from Ruth... <clears throat> From Ruth 1, so chapter 1, verse 1 to 22, we see that Ruth decides to remain and care for Naomi. We see that she also moves with Naomi back to Bethlehem. So after they spent over 10 years in, in Moab and, they, and the father died, the two sons died, they were struggling. They struggled. And, they were, and, and you have to remember one thing, and you guys would understand this. In those days, if you became a widow, and I mean a female widow, not a man widow, because a man could still go and fend for himself. But if you're a female we widow, you were ostracized from your society because you were seen as somebody who doesn't have faith. You're not valuable. Unless somebody would come and redeem your heritage, would come and redeem your family line. That's very important. Now, Naomi didn't have a sons to redeem that. She only had daughter-in-laws. On top of that, these daughter-in-laws were Moab women. They were not even Israeli women. 
So this is a big thing in those days. It's a big deal. It's not like today. It's a big deal. So she thought about this very carefully. She sat down with them and said, <coughs> excuse me. She said, hey, you know, you are young. Go out there. Have, live your life. You don't have to stay with me. Just go. And Orpah, the only God is my God. That is very important because that is what gave her the strength and the motivation to keep going, no matter what she faced together with Naomi. She said, your God is my God. She took upon her life the God of Israel. And it was the God of Israel that gave her that strength to keep fighting. She was an outsider, remember that? She was walking into Bethlehem as an outsider. Yet she held on. So when they come into Bethlehem, they've got nothing to do. But her mother-in-law says, why don't you go into the fields? And again, in those days, <clears throat> read, read some of the history and stuff. In those days, a woman, a widow, going into the fields alone was actually quite dangerous. In fact, uh, Naomi mentions this to Ruth. Very blessed that you found Boaz's field, that you are not elsewhere because you could have been in danger. What does that mean? Well, she could have been raped. A lot of bad things would happen in those days because it was seen as a woman that's on her own. There's no, there's no cover over her. I'm not trying to be old-fashioned. It's, it's how it was in those days. That's how it was. That, that was the culture as well behind it. And she, God led her to Boaz's field. And she was picking up, basically, her job was picking up the scraps of the other people. So that she could, she was working for not only to feed herself, but to feed her mother-in-law. Somebody she didn't have to look after. She decided to look after. She decided to stay with her no matter what. Ruth 3, verse 1 to 18. Ruth 3, verse 1 to 18, says, Ruth requests redemption by Boaz. What does that mean? But again, the mother will start talking to her, start thinking about their situation and going, I can't keep my daughter in law in this situation. I can't keep her just picking up scraps, spending a whole day going out in the field just so that we can have a little bit of grain. So she began to think about, the, the Bible verses later on, the story tells you that, she began to think about selling the land, selling her the, the things that she had. She thought, I have to sell these. And she also thought, hey, Boaz, is part of my family. Boaz can carry on the line that I have with my kids. So she talked to Naomi and said something that, that was unusual in those days. She said to her, why don't you go and lay down? If you see him laying down on the fields, go and lay down next to him. It was a sign of like, it was like a sign of you going up to them and saying, hey, you're my family member. It's your responsibility. You should be taking charge. Because remember, you know that in the scriptures it says that if a brother died, yeah, if there was another brother in the family, that brother had to go and get married to that family, to that lady, to carry on the line. So this was a tradition that was very strong in the Jewish culture. So when they found out that Boaz was actually part of their family, they said, oh wow, this man is God brought into our life. This man can actually redeem this family. We don't have to stay alone. We don't have to remain like this for the rest of our lives. So she was bold, she listened, she was obedient to, to her mother-in-law, she was bold, and she'd done that. Now Boaz, according to the story, we see that Boaz was actually much older than her. And he was very impressed by not only the, fact, the way that she behaved, in the way that she wept, but she was really impressed as well, by, he was really impressed as well by her, by the fact that he, she came to him first. And like he said, he didn't go to some young, good-looking guy, rich guy. He came, those that are faithful will be rewarded. This is in his story. It shows integrity. Now, Ruth 4, Ruth 4, 1 to 22. Ruth is rewarded and redeemed by Boaz. So we read that the story where Boaz goes, hey, you know what? I'm going to redeem you, but there's another person before me who's, who has the, the right to actually redeem you first, has the right to take charge first, not me. I have to speak to that person first. So he gathered all the leaders of the, of the, of the area. He spoke to them. He spoke to the, to the man. And we don't know. We don't know the man's name. We don't know if the man was married. Maybe that's... So he actually done it. He took charge of it. He, he bought the land. And he took hold of Ruth as his wife. Now, why did I mention that they were there for 10 years? Because think about it. The whole story says Ruth was married for 10 years. He does not talk about any babies. It does not talk about fruitfulness at all. Now, I'm not saying that she wasn't fruitful during the time that she was there, but fruitfulness in terms of kids. The specific things that a church goes through, yeah. and even individuals, as individual Christians, that we have desires in our hearts that we want to be fruitful in. Sometimes the fruit doesn't come until later. 
Remember, there's always seasons for everything. There's a season to plant, there's a season to harvest. You can't harvest whenever you want. You need to plant first. And I believe there's, that there's been harvest along the way of, this, of, this, of the life of this church. These guys have been around for what? 20 something years? And you've, you, you've grabbed a lot of harvest along the way, but you've also planted a lot of seeds that you haven't seen the fruit come out of it yet. But the time is coming. The fruit is coming. It has to be a seasonal thing. There's a season for everything. Ruth 4, 17 to 22 is the bigger picture. Now this I'm going to concentrate on now. Ruth 4, 17 to 22. This is where I was a bit, the first time I read it, I was a bit puzzled. And I thought, okay, what a great, lovely, exciting, inspiring story. Simple story, actually. And then God puts a genealogy right at the end of the story. And you go, what is that about? What, what does that mean? Well, that's the bigger picture. As I, I, as I was praying and asking God, okay, what do, you, what do you want me to say about this? What are, you, what are you trying to say out of this? Let me read the scripture because it's important that we read it. Also, the neighbor women gave him a name. That's the baby that was born to Ruth and Boaz. Gave him a name saying, there is a son born to Naomi. See, they acknowledge the, the bloodline through Naomi. It wasn't just Ruth's baby. It was also through Naomi. They honored Naomi's bloodline as well. And they called his name Obed. You know what Obed means? It means the one who serves or the worshipper. It's funny because his, his mom was the one that's, that served all that time in the field. And now he's called the worshipper, the one who serves. There is a son born to Naomi. They called, him, called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse. The father of oh, Jesse, the father of David. Now, this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. And Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon. And Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz. Boaz begot Obed. Boaz begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David. How many times have we read through scripture? Tenth generation bloodlines. God talks about the blessings of 10th generations. Everything God puts in His Word is specific. Everything He puts in His Word is intentional. Even numbers that come up is very intentional. It means something. And I believe that God is talking through this as well about the generations of this church. He's, I won't say more, otherwise I won't this story. But anyway, <laughs> let us continue. Okay, so the bigger picture. I'm going to point out three points, three points that I believe God has talked about in this church. The first point is we see a barren Ruth. Ten years in, 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 um, in Moab, not once we hear about her having a baby. She comes back to Bethlehem, she didn't have a baby. So she was barren during that time. We see a barren Ruth. And in, verse, uh, in chapter 1, verse 4, we were told that she had been married, like I said, for ten years to Mar Marlon, and there were no children. Furthermore, Chapter 4, verse 11, the townspeople pray, pray for Boaz and Ruth. Why do they need to pray for Boaz and Ruth? They pray for Boaz and Ruth. They know that Ruth was married for 10 years without a child. So they remember, this is the key, they remember Rachel. So I'm not making up a story here. This was absolutely about barrenness. They said they remembered Rachel. What was Rachel's problem? She could not bear. She was the most beautiful one, but yet she couldn't bear. Her sister which the father deceived the husband with, produced babies like this, man. That's right, so she, was, she was getting pregnant all the time, but the most beautiful one, she couldn't bear anything. It's like, what's going on here? Do you understand? So it had to do with barrenness as well. So they remembered Rachel, whose womb the Lord had opened long before, and they prayed that God would make Ruth, like Rachel and Leah, fruitful. <clears throat> what am I trying to say? There are areas in our lives, like I said before, there are areas even in this church where many of you are going, why are we going through that again? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? It doesn't mean you're barren. God is turning that around for you to become fruitful at it. But it's a journey as well. It's like they say, you know, God doesn't get us out of it, He gets us through it. Why? Because if He gets us out of it, there is no testimony in it. How can He testify of His goodness? How can He testify of His power? of his redemption if you're not going through it. 
It's only when you go through it that you're able to teach and testify to others. Amen? You have to go through the situation. You have to go through the issues and learn and overcome them. Otherwise, you'll face the same thing over and over again. Until you learn your lesson, you'll just keep facing the same thing over and over again. Now, the second point. So remember, the first point, he is a, a God of fruitfulness. Remember what he did. He brought, up, brought the barren Ruth for fruitful Ruth. He was able to carry on that line. Second point is the genealogy. We see a genealogy, and when we read it, from our point of view, it's like, oh yeah, it's just ten generations. What's the big deal? But the genealogy, in God's eyes, wasn't just a genealogy. It was a legacy. God wants a legacy. And I believe this, this church has a strong calling to leave a legacy behind. You're not just called to be a generation just like any other church. You're actually called to leave a legacy behind. Legacy it carries on from generation to generation. Amen? Amen. Is this speaking to you? <laughs> Amen. Okay. So in chapter 4, verse 18, the author reveals a genealogy, like I said, ten generations, and I like how John Piper puts it. John Piper said, God's plot was not only for the temporal blessing of a few Jews in Bethlehem. Sometimes it's so easy for us because we face obstacles after obstacles after obstacles after obstacles. It's so easy to, to get to the point where you just want to overcome that obstacle and go, okay, help me to overcome just step by step, Lord. And at times that's all we see in front of us, just the obstacles. We don't see the bigger picture because it's easy. It's easy to do that. Trust me, guys. I'm young, but we've gone through it. Very recently, we went through it. Very recently. And it was tough. It was a hard lesson to learn, but we, we learned it. We're going through it. It's, it's part of the journey. It makes us stronger as well. Remember what Jesus went through. He promised and he said to that the things that I've gone through, you will go through as well. So we, we are meant to go through situations, we're meant to go through long suffering as well, we're meant to share this blessing, but we're meant to go through long suffering as well. And the key here is like Paul said, rejoice, I've learned to rejoice, I've, I've learned to have joy in all circumstances, when I'm down or when I'm up. Recently, recently Heidi Baker actually mentioned something online on Facebook. For years apparently, for years, she's been really... Um, aggravated about how people have invited her around the world. I don't know if you saw this post. And every time they invited her, they put her up in some five-star, seven-star hotel. And she felt really bad because she's like, man, I've got my kids back home barely eating meat. They're eating like rice and beans and stuff. And these guys are putting me in five-star hotels. And she felt so bad that for years she would not, she would not sleep in the hotel bed. She would sleep on the floor. And God actually rebuked her. She wrote this on, on Facebook. He rebuked her and said, My daughter, learn to accept my blessing. Learn that there are times, there are times in your life where you need to have joy in extravagance and luxury. And there are times when you won't have it. So rejoice in it. It's part of the journey. Have joy about it. Amen? <clears throat> Alright, so, so he was preparing. This is what God was doing. He was preparing for the coming of the greatest king that Israel would ever have. Arguably the greatest king, David. Also, the name of David, remember that, carries with it the hope of the Messiah. Did you see the, ge the genealogy there? It wasn't just about the next king. It wasn't just about all these other... It carries with it the name of the Messiah. Um... I know this is going to, is going to sound cliche, but I have to be bold about this. I really have to be bold about this. Seriously, guys, there's not many churches I go and preach on, preach to, where I would say that, where I'll be this bold. But I'll tell you what, this church is not called just to be a church of generation to generation. You, you're going to carry a legacy that will usher in the second coming of Jesus. This is a very bold thing for me to say. And you can hold me accountable about it. For sure, remember one thing because prophets come, prophets go, prophets prophesy things. But I tell you what, unless we move, those things won't come to pass. Keep moving. I know many of you guys are like, you probably feel worn out. Like, years and years, Lord, I've been working hard, pressing in, sowing so much into the church. I don't have much strength. You do. You have no idea what you're going through and how God looks at you and sees the, the extra strength, the extra grace He's given you. 
He's, he's going to give you, and I believe that. He's given you already, but He's going to give you even more, like these guys were singing, a fresh feeling. He's going to give you even more strength, even more uh, a youthfulness for you to carry on the work that is ahead. Amen? All right. So He carries on also the, net, the hope of the Messiah, freedom from pain, from crying, and grief, and guilt. The life, I like this quote, the life of the godly is not a straight line to glory, but they do get there. God sees to it. It's not a straight line, but we get there. There is a hope for us beyond the cute baby and the happy grandmother. And that is the, the legacy. I feel this really strong. There's fruitfulness. Guys, there is fruitfulness. We are in a time where we're entering the time of harvest. And there is fruitfulness ahead. How do you prepare? How do you redeem your time for the fruitfulness? Get prepared. For example, George, how do I want, if I want more preachings, if I want more invitations to go out there and minister the word of God, because this is what I do, this is my living, how do, I, how do I prepare for it? Do I just pray and intercede and fast? That's not enough. Act. What does that mean? George, spend time. Prepare words. If God's giving me a word. Prepare the words. Because I'm, I'm actually pro prophetically declaring things into the future. I'm preparing for the next invitation. Prepare the words. Prepare whatever God's giving you. Put it on paper. Declare it. Pray about it. And God will open up that door. We need to act as well. Amen? Yes. And don't worry, God, some of you are... Because I feel this strong, man. Hey, I'm, I'm not freaky. God heard the thoughts of people, so I'm not, I'm not uh, being... Uh, it's not an abomination or whatever here. I can hear some of these guys say, but we can't do it alone. Don't worry, God's going to bring people to help God will bring the right people to help. Um, I just want to add something to it, right? I so love it when, when, um, when George said that because I, I actually could hear your thoughts, right? And in saying that, some of you, I've, I heard some of you say, that's all good, George, but where is the next generation in this room? Right? Where is it? We've heard the word, we've listened to the word, we know the word, we want to say it. And this is what I believe God is saying. Is it not for me to bring it to pass? It's for you to be obedient. You do not make the way of how it's going to happen. You are obedient in doing what I tell you to do. And I will provide the next generation. I will usher them into this house. You do not have to conform to the next generation of society and world on how it needs to be done and how to cater to them and how to make them feel happy to stay in this place. Do not even dare do that. Because the legacy means you're going to bring hard yaka, right, with them. And when that happens, they're going to learn. They're going to learn to walk the walk that they are meant to walk so they can leave it for the next one to come. But do not conform to the way the churches are doing. Do not say, I want it to be all this peepee -pee out there. I want it to have that much um, kids being out there. I want to do this. I want to do that. Please do not compare. Right? As are the whole body in Christ, right? Each churches have their own vision. Each churches have their own place. Each churches have their own mandate from God. Stick to our mandate. I said ours because we are, we are part of this church now. Stick to our, our, our mandate. And as we stick to it, as we believe, the things that is not yet seen as if it is seen, as we walk into it, as we walk into it not on our own strengths, but onto the word that he has given, onto the promises that he has given. And yes, there will be time where you'll be like, you know, after a month and things is so hard and you're like, George and Sabrina, they preach over there, we are, we are believing and oh my God, many they come to church outside. <laughs> you know? And, and you know what? I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. It doesn't matter. When the time comes, that's what we have each other for. Sister, brother, I can't handle it. I want this to happen in church, but I don't know how it's going to happen. Well, that's okay. Come together. Let's pray together. Let's edify together. But do not let go of that light. Do not let go of that word. Hold it by force. Take it by force. The Bible says you take it by force and you shake it and you say, It is mine and it is mine and it is mine and it is yes and amen and no matter what, I will see it to pass. Yeah, just stay here for now. I'll give you a last point. The last point is what I mentioned before is about rewards. Ruth 2, verse 12. 
says, the Lord repaid your work. You've been working hard for years and years and years and years of being working hard. He will reward you. It's not George's promise, it's not Sabrina's promise, it's his work. So hold on to his work and say, you promised this. I'm not letting go until uh, I receive it. It's his promise and God is not a man to lie. That's what the word says. He's not a man that will lie. He will fulfill his word. Amen? So the Lord will repay your work and a full reward, reward be given you by the Lord God. Full reward. Not half, not a little bit, not three quarters, a full reward. Will be given you by the Lord God of Israel. Under whose wings, so he's covering us, you have come for rest. Cover us with, that, with his wings. He will give us rest. There's a time to work, there's a time to rest. The Bible talks about that. So rewards, and there's something else that I wanted to mention. So remember, there's uh, three points that I mentioned, and I feel that's really specific, but this is God has put a status, uh, I saw like a, it's a branding. You, you remember like the cattle, it's the brand, the cattle? And I saw that God is, put, is branding this church with fruitfulness, with a sign saying fruitfulness, and then with a thing saying legacy, and then with another one saying Rewards. This is part of the calling of this church. You will receive it. You will receive it. That's that's part of it. You will just receive it. Just embrace it as He uh, rewards us. The other thing that I saw as well, part of this message, is, and I think I mentioned this briefly to Sue, Pastor Mark and Sue, was that uh, the other day was that I saw God's God's uh, imprinted this on my mind really strong, and He said, "I'm redeeming the wells." I'm redeeming the wells. Now, this is important. What, is, what does it mean by that? When you redig wells, if you're redigging, redigging, you're not digging a new well, you're redigging wells, there's a foundation there. Remember that. In fact, let me give you another example. In fact, isn't this building, I think Pastor Mark mentioned, this building that way back, years ago, these guys always got this building. We always got this building. Years ago, I wasn't here, but we always got this building. Yet God gave it to you at the right season in a better condition than it was before. See, he built upon the foundation of this building. This building carries with it revival in Frankston. It carries revival in Frankston, guys. See, God is waiting for the right time, for the right harvest to release that blessing, the full reward. He's not going to release just a little bit. He's going to release the full reward for your hard work. So I saw him, uh, he was saying... I'm redigging the wells. And as he was redigging the wells, he said, and I'm going to build upon the foundations. I'm going to build upon the foundations. I don't, don't believe, because I prayed about this for a long time in Sabrina during the week. I don't believe God is doing a new thing. I believe he's building upon what you've done. That's why she was saying that very clearly. Don't try and change. Don't try and bring hype and all this sort of stuff. As long as we, because we're conjuring it up out of our own strength. That will only last until we're not strong enough. But when it comes from God, when it's built upon integrity, when it's built upon a foundation, that's different. Because we're not doing it out of our own strength. God's built that foundation, He'll build upon it. Foundation is very important. The Bible talks about that over and over again. Amen? Amen. So I, I, I saw that very clearly. I'm redeeming the wells. The other point that Sabrina mentioned actually during the week is what you said about Nehemiah. Nehemiah, Nehemiah and the wall. He said, rebuilding the wall. The story talks about him rebuilding the wall. It doesn't say he's building a new wall. Hello? God does not build upon a foundation that is not stable. That is not good. If the foundation of this place was not good, he would do a new thing. Seriously, he would. Because if it's not good, he'll get rid of all the junk and he'll bring in the right foundation. But he hasn't done that. You stuck to it. So there's integrity. There's a good foundation in this place that God is building upon. Amen? Amen. 